Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the ITM Power PLC Investor presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the presentation itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I would now like to hand you over to Dr. Graham Cooley, CEO, Dr. Simon Bourne, CTO, and Andy Allen, FD of ITM Power PLC. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for joining this WebEx. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, just to introduce the presenting team, um, I'm Graham Cooley. I'm the CEO of ITM Power. You'll also be hearing from Andy Allen, who's the Chief Financial Officer, and Dr. Simon Bourne, who's the Chief Technology Officer. Uh, we're three of the four executive team at ITM Power, and we've worked together um, at ITM Power for over a decade. So um, I'm going to begin with a section on um, the, the uh, funding round. I'm going to talk to you ab about an executive summary um, of the funding round, uh, say something about why hydrogen and why now, talk to you about the investment case, uh, talk to you about ITM Power's positioning and also our partners. And then I'm going to hand over to Simon Bourne. Um, he's going to talk to you about the ITM Power acceleration plan. And the 150 million um, equity fundraise um, is directed towards the acceleration of ITM Power at the very large scale. So it's those uh, very large industrial installations um, that we're targeting because of um, a massive increase in industrial demand for those systems. And Simon will talk you through the technology manufacturing and operations acceleration and also a further investment in ITM Motive. And then Simon will hand over to um, Andy Allen, our Chief Financial Officer, who will talk you through uh, the results, um, our contracts backlog, and all, also the tender opportunity pipeline. And then right at the end, I'll give you um, a quick summary. So it's, this is another transformational deal for ITM Power. Um, so we've announced, uh, we announced late last night, um, this strategic partnership uh, with SNAM. And SNAM are the second largest gas company, gas transmission company in the world, second only to Gazprom. Um, so uh, SNAM also have a very well articulated strategy of moving their gas grid from methane to green hydrogen. And the CAO, uh, Marco Alvira, is very vocal in Europe about the transition of the gas grid um, to a net zero gas, uh, that being green hydrogen. Um, the other very important thing that was announced uh, during the funding round was that the EU um, have announced that um, net zero will be put into, into law across Europe. So very important to note that green hydrogen, that is hydrogen made from renewable power and electrolysis, is the only net zero energy gas. And um, SNAM's network is the most extensive across Europe, including an, uh, their investment in the interconnector, which also goes to the UK. So along with a strategic investment of 30 million, SNAM are also uh, assigned a, a commercial partnership agreement, which includes as the first element, a portfolio of projects to 100 megawatts. We are preferred supplier, and there's a commitment uh, to do those projects in the next four to five years. But there's much larger potential for the collaboration. And um, Italy is yet to announce its um, hydrogen strategy that's imminent, and it's expected to be at the gigawatt level. So um, the first projects of 100 megawatts are in Italy, but um, SNAM are uh, present across the whole of Europe and internationalizing. So uh, 150 um, million equity raise, we actually took after incredibly strong demand, 165 million, um, including the investment from SNAM, and there is also a 7 million um, open offer. So achievements over the last 12 months. So we now have a record backlog of, of just short of 120 million. We have a very strongly increasing tender 
opportunity pipeline. This is the pipeline of fixed price turnkey quotations we've made against commercial tenders. Um, and that's a, a, a very uh, intensive relationship uh, with Linda Engineering to take us to a pipeline of 325 million of projects. Uh, we're occupying Bessemer Park at the moment. Actually, the executive team moved into their offices two weeks ago. I uh, was delighted um, to see the progress in Bessemer Park. We're moving the equipment in across November um, and we will be uh, manufacturing in the factory uh, towards the end of the year. We announced a eight megawatt and a 10 megawatt deal. The 10 megawatt deal comes with a strategic partnership with a Scottish Power Renewables that's part of the Iberdrola Group. Um, and uh, we also announced a 100 megawatt feed study. That's a front end engineering design study at, in Humberside. And that 100 megawatt feed study is with um, ITM Linda Electrolysis, with Orsted and with Philips 66, a very important project for the UK. Uh, we've, we finished the formation of the 50-50 uh, joint venture with Linda Engineering and are experiencing very strong momentum with Linda in key strategic markets. Uh, why uh, green hydrogen and why now? Um, well, um, there's two very, very important reasons. First of all, the reduction in the cost of renewable energy. As renewable power comes down in cost, of course, it's the uh, dominant cost uh, for, for uh, green hydrogen. And as renewable power co costs come down, so the cost of, uh, of uh, green hydrogen comes down. So there's a, 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 an improving cost structure from renewable power, but also the reduction in the cost of electrolysis. And as you have more and more renewable power, then you need more and more energy storage. And I think there's very broad agreement that um, the best way of storing huge amounts uh, of uh, electrical energy for very long periods of time is to turn electrons into molecules because molecules are easy to store. And the other very important reason is net zero targets. As I said, the EU are putting net zero, net zero into law now and green hydrogen is the only net zero energy gas. And to put this in context, um, Europe today uses 400 terawatt hours of grey hydrogen and all of that needs to be decarbonized. So that's mainly for ammonia and refineries. So you, even if you remove all of the hydrogen needed for the gas grid and all of the hydrogen needed for transport and you just look at the existing industrial applications, it's equivalent to 140 gigawatts of electrolysis. So we had a really transformational um, announcement from uh, the EU, um, seems a long time ago now, it was the 8th of July, of, of 150 billion of stimuli for the green hydrogen industry. So this is six gigawatts of electrolysis to, to be deployed in the next four years, 40 gigawatts to be deployed in the next decade, and 100 billion over the next decade, so 10 billion a year for 10 years, for contracts for difference auctions for green hydrogen. And we've also had gigawatt announcements from Germany, Holland, Portugal, France, Spain, uh, Italy imminently coming, Poland imminently coming, the UK's strategy coming first quarter of 2021. So ITM Power in incredibly uh, good position. We, we um, we were the first electrolyzer company to move into a gigawatt scale factory. We announced um, uh, with the funding round that we now have provision uh, to establish a second gigawatt factory. Uh, we have great technology leadership. We have very strong partners with the likes of Shell, Linda, SNAM, Orsted, um, and um, uh, Scottish Power Renewables, part of the Iberdrola Group. So, uh, it looks um, uh, like ITM Power is incredibly well positioned to take this uh, very important um, energy transition. In fact, um, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance referred to it as a once in a lifetime opportunity. So market drivers then, um, rapid adoption of large scale 
hydrogen energy systems, massive commercial activity, government stimuli and net zero targets. And the demand that's coming is for very large scale systems. And Simon's going to talk you through our uh, acceleration plan to accelerate uh, the electrolysis equipment at the very large scale. And by very large, um, I mean uh, tens or hundreds of megawatts in size. So uh, we're looking at acceleration in the area of technology, manufacturing and operations. And the outcomes then uh, to consolidate our uh, current leadership position uh, to create volume, which correspondingly leads to cost reduction, market share and the increase of recurring revenue. So in terms of partnerships, then we have three very significant partnerships, Shell, Linda and SNAM. All three have now done commercial and technical due diligence on ITM power. And we've been through a long process with all three of them. Uh, at first um, started working with, with uh, Shell uh, in 2013. Uh, and our first announcement about our Shell relationship was in 2015. That was a siting agreement for siting ITM power refueling stations on Shell forecourts, including co-branding. Uh, we developed the relationship and, and the projects for deploying those refueling stations also with Linda, with Linda Fuel Tech. Um, and so our relationship with Linda also goes back um, over half a decade. We were delighted when Shell selected ITM Power for the 10 megawatt refinery project. That's the refine project. It's the largest PEM electrolyzer in the world. It's being deployed at the Rhineland refinery, and it's a very, very important reference plant for ITM Power and for Shell. Uh, its importance is that green hydrogen at refineries has been included in the Red 2 directive, and all refineries have to make 14% of their product renewably by 2030. So they've got one decade. And if you look at um, uh, replacing brown hydrogen with green hydrogen at refineries and you only replace 10% of the hydrogen at refineries that's a market of 90 billion euros of electrolysis so it's a massive entry market um, our relationship with um, uh, Linda we announced um, in October of 2019 um, uh, Linda became a 20% shareholder in ITM power um, and our relationship with them is centered around EPC contracting. So in the past, um, ITM used to bid turnkey solutions and we would take the EPC contract as well as the um, electrolyzer manufacturing. And that's for ITM was the high risk part. Uh, actually, um, EPC contracting, it, it, we can say is outside of our skill set, particularly doing it on a global scale. And actually any project overruns that we had were always in the area of the EPC contracting, pouring the concrete, uh, bending the pipes, wiring diagrams, all those good things that Linda do. They've got 80,000 employees and they've got offices worldwide for doing EPC contracting. So we were delighted to, to de develop that relationship uh, with Linda. It allows ITM to concentrate on what we're really good at and that is manufacturing electrolysis equipment, developing gigafactories and manufacturing large scale uh, um, electrolysis equipment at very high volume. Um, Linda have massive purchasing power in the area of balance of plant, and we have developed a bid structure with Linda, uh, which means that we now have a tender opportunity pipeline achieved together of 325 million. And then finally, SNAM, uh, a, a very important partner for us because the largest application for green hydrogen is the gas grid and also the replacement of LNG. Um, and SNAM, uh, being the second largest a, a gas transmission company in the world, are also the most vocal about um, replacing their gas grid with a green hydrogen grid. Uh, we were delighted. Uh, when they uh, uh, approached us a year ago now, actually. So we've spent a year developing the relationship. Culmination of that is a commercial partnership agreement. They suggested an investment in ITM Power 
that comes with the first stage of 100 megawatts uh, with a very large pipeline of further projects. So the, the last point to make is that all three of those companies uh, know each other very well. So look, um, uh, our overall target um, and, and the use of funds are directed towards this is targeting lowest cost green hydrogen and bringing that forward at the very large scale by two years. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Simon Bourne and he's going to talk you through uh, uh, the areas of acceleration and the use of funds in technology, manufacturing, operations, and also our refueling assets business and ITM motive. So Simon, if I can uh, hand over to you uh, to uh, go through that. Okay, thanks Graham. And uh, good morning, everyone. I've got five slides to run through one for each of the four pillars of the acceleration plan and one outlining our drive in electrolyzer cost reduction. So I'm going to start with technology and I think it's worth emphasizing at the start that we've been at this for a long time at ITM. We've been developing PEM technology for 20 years and there really isn't a shortcut um, and we're only in this position today because of that effort over a sustained period of time. And we have been through some extensive technology due diligence exercises. Graham mentioned um, Shell. Uh, we're delighted to be working with Shell to supply the largest electrolyzer of its type into Shell's flagship uh, refinery um, in Rhineland, just outside Cologne. And we've, um, with Linda Engineering, of course, they looked very deeply at the electrolyzer space and our technology before deciding to partner with us and develop the joint venture. And now, of course, we have SNEM as well. Um, the spirit of the acceleration in the area of technology is about getting larger. And we're developing our fourth generation stack platform. It will be our largest at five megawatts in size. And the reason we're doing that is to be able to more readily access the opportunities at the large end of the electrolyzer spectrum. And this is the end of the spectrum that we see growing the most uh, quickly. We're working very closely with Linda Engineering to pre-engineer several of these stack modules together into a 20 megawatt package. And we call this the 20 megawatt train. And the rationale is the same. It's to pre-engineer the largest possible building block to enable us to engage with those large scale opportunities. And that minimizes the amount of design and engineering work that needs to take place on a project by project basis. So the use of, of funds reflect that with emphasis on the five megawatt stack platform and also the 20 megawatt train. There's provision for some associated product development and dedicated engineering resource. And there's also a piece for global compliance to enable us to sell it and deploy internationally. So this exercise will get us the best in class electrolyzer module available two years earlier to engage with this opportunity. On to uh, manufacturing. The picture on the right is Bessemer Park. It's the largest electrolyzer factory of its type with an ultimate capacity of one gigawatt a year. And we're only in this position because we've spent a long time doing the heavy lifting, understanding how to put a factory like this together in all of the detail, what machines to use, how to organize the flow of production, testing, and all of those things. Having done that, we've developed a blueprint for a gigafactory. And seeing the rapid growth in the demand for electrolyzer systems, we feel we need to plan for additional production capacity. So we want to be able to replicate Bessemer Park in a strategic location to optimize our cost structure, quality, and access to local supply chain. We're also driving down lead times. The faster we can supply product, the more competitive we are in the marketplace, and that supports further project wins. So the use of funds gives us the provision to replicate Bessemer Park and also to hold additional stock, in particular long lead time items, so that we can bring down our own uh, lead time um, of electrolyzer systems. So together, the ability to double our capacity from one to two gigawatts a year and halve lead times from 14 to less than eight months. So something about um, electrolyzer cost reduction. This is a continuation of what we've been working at for several years. And we have a very aggressive cost reduction target aiming to halve the cost of the electrolyzer within five years. 
And ITM owns all of its technology and product platform. And so we are perfectly placed to make improvements at every single level of the technology and the product. The biggest gains from a cost reduction perspective are in the area of the PEM stack itself and power conversion systems. And they are two of several areas that we're looking at intensively. We have a very strong emphasis on product standardization and modularization. And that is about ITM building the same things again and again so that we can get our volumes up, our costs down, and get slick at manufacturing, adopting semi-automation processes such as those which are being incorporated into Bessemer Park. We've been working very closely with um, Linda Engineering in this area as well. Gray mentioned that Linda have tremendous buying power and there are several opportunities for ITM to piggyback on that buying power so that we can achieve larger cost breaks much more quickly than we would be able to do uh, by ourselves. The graph on the right shows two things. The red line shows the increase in average order size as we see it moving forward in time, and that's a reflection of our pipeline. The blue bars represent the cost reduction as a function of manufacturing volume, cost breaks and procurement power, and the application of technology improvements as they mature from our innovation pipeline. And this is a metric that we look at very carefully, and I can tell you that we are tracking ahead um, of this target today. In summary, we are less than a thousand euros per kilowatt for the full system today at the megawatt scale, less than 800 euros per kilowatt at the, meg at the 10 megawatt scale, and we will be less than 500 euros per kilowatt by the mid 2020s. On to operations. And this is about expanding our capacity in the areas of installation, commissioning, and after sales support so that it can keep pace with the growing uh, order intake. Building on our reputation and developing world-class after-sales support packages to maximize both the availability and the performance of the equipment in the field. To do that, we need to increase the size of the team and we need to hold critical spares in strategic locations so that we can respond really quickly when we need to and also simplify the planned preventative maintenance activities we'll be conducting in the field. We'll also be developing partnerships with third parties in new territories where ITM currently doesn't have a footprint so that we can offer these services in those territories much more quickly than we would be able to do otherwise. And taken together, operations represent the development of a growing recurring revenue stream for after-sales support and ongoing maintenance packages. The use of funds reflects the need for working capital, increased spares holding and team expansion, and also some fundamental work we're doing with Linda Engineering on reliability, availability, and maintainability analysis. And this is about making sure that our existing and future products are inherently as reliable as possible and that performing maintenance activities is as simple as possible. We'll also be making some upgrades to our control center. That's the picture on the right. The control center is where we gather all of the data from our equipment that's deployed in the field. It's incredibly valuable to us and it's also a location from which we can offer remote support 24 hours a day to our clients and our own field engineers internationally. So expanding the after sales team to access a growing recurring revenue stream for maintenance packages. The final slide from me is on ITM Motive. This is the branch of ITM that's concerned with hydrogen refueling and we've been an early mover in uh, refueling, particularly in the UK, developing a network of refueling stations centered around London. We've been able to access both EU and UK grant support to get equipment in the field early, demonstrate its performance, show that it's reliable, and in doing that we've been able to develop a really strong reputation and brand in the area of hydrogen refueling. It's also enabled us to look through the eyes of an owner operator and really understand <clears throat> what it takes to operate a network of refueling stations. The day-to-day -day maintenance and support, the locations that work well, locations that don't work well. And um, that has been an incredible um, a learning experience for us. But this represents a slight change of focus. We want to move away from the small refueling stations in favor of larger stations directed towards commercial vehicles, such as buses, trucks, and trains. And those are the sort of vehicles that return to the same place as a captive fleet 
to refuel every day. And as such, they give you much higher utilization of the equipment and the hydrogen call off is predictable and bankable. We've appointed a new managing director for ITM Motive, a guy called Duncan Yellen, very experienced guy from Onji, to develop this strategy going forward with an emphasis on profitability. The funds that we have here are intended to be geared um, with um, UK grant support and other funds we believe available um, to support continued rollout of hydrogen refueling in the UK. So it's an opportunity to build on our reputation and our brand and gain access to an attractive double digit return on investment. That's the final slide from me. I'll hand over to Andy Allen. He'll talk to the finances. Thanks, Simon. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the uh, results snapshot for the year ended 30th of April, the contracts backlog, which is what's going to be going through our factory next, and the tender opportunity pipeline, which is what we've quoted in the last 12 months. Uh, the picture you see on the right hand side is uh, of the electrolyzer at the Shell Rhineland refinery, um, a flagship project for us and for Shell. Uh, we're actually in the process of installing it now and it will be producing hydrogen early next year. So in terms of the uh, the year to April 2020, it's very much uh, uh, in a case of setting in place the building blocks uh, for this demand that we see coming. Uh, not only did we formalise our partnership with Linda and create a joint venture, uh, which is all about business development and uh, you know, going after global opportunities, uh, but we also uh, put a lot of uh, building blocks in place for Bessemer Park, not only the people and capabilities, but systems and the equipment that we're going to need to really uh, address that, that demand and have the gigawatts worth of capacity. So revenue in the year was £3.3 .3 million, pounds, uh, down probably about £1.5 million as a result of uh, COVID-related site restrictions, uh, and we had grants receivable of £2.1 million, down from £12 million the year before. Part of that was the impact of Brexit and the fact that we've won far, you, far fewer EU grants uh, since 2016 in the referendum, but also uh, a conscious decision by the company that we're actually looking to change the income mix to one of uh, sales revenue. Our EBITDA loss from operations was £18.1 million pounds, and of that we had gross losses on legacy projects of £6.1 million. Now for us a legacy project uh, predates the partnership with Linda. Uh, it was a period of time where ITM were offering full turnkey solutions uh, with the EPC work, the installation, the commissioning, the on-site wiring, uh, etc. And, and uh, really, when you look at those uh, legacy projects, the costing for the products was very accurate, but the costing for the EPC element was, was not accurate uh, and has led to these losses. So this was very much a key driver for us partnering with Linda. And I've got a slide later on that shows how the scope is now split differently so that ITM only make core standard modules. Uh, in terms of people, uh, the company have uh, just under 200 staff and more than half of those people are engaged in manufacturing and uh, product deployment. Uh, so we're really gearing up for moving into Bessemer Park. Uh, in terms of uh, the balance sheet, we had a net cash position of £40 million. And as Simon said, we've uh, reviewed our refueling network during the year. Uh, that did lead to an impairment of £5.6 million in the period. And uh, we will retain those sites we will put larger, higher capacity uh, stations on there, uh, which, which will have a higher utilization in order to generate a recurring income. So in terms of uh, bridges, on the left-hand side, you've got an EBITDA bridge. Uh, the EBITDA in 2019 was a loss of 7.3 million. The impact of that on-site EPC work was 4.9 million in the year, and a uh, loss of grant income of 5.6 million. And then you see two bits, uh, for investments, so we've uh, invested in people, our payroll went up by 1.8 million, uh, but we made savings in overheads of 1.5 million, leaving us with an EBITDA loss of 18.1. In terms of cash, uh, we started the year with 5.2 million. Uh, in autumn 2019, we raised 58 million pounds net. Uh, we then had negative operating cash flows of 19.5 million. Uh, a chunk of that was offset uh, through some very good work with suppliers to redefine terms. Uh, and uh, we improved our working capital position by 7.3 million. The last three orange boxes uh, are all about investment for the future. We invested 0.3 million in our joint venture and Linda matched that. Uh, for us, that's about bid discipline and business development on large scale opportunities. 
Uh, we, we invested £9 million in Besmer Park. That's both the fit out and the equipment to go in there. And the first equipment was installed at the end of September. And finally, the next generation product that Simon was talking about, a five megawatt module and a 20 megawatt train, uh, the, the first bits of work um, cost us 1.8 million in the year, leaving us with 40 million at year end. In terms of what's coming next for ITM Power, uh, this is our backlog. Uh, and we have two categories for our backlog. The gray bar is uh, what's under contract. Uh, and the yellow bar is what's in negotiations. So for us, it's 100% one. Uh, it's just a case of us signing contracts. And typically, um, any delay to signing contracts is about uh, us getting uh, extra warranties, extra after sales support, and additional elements to the contract sorted. The green bar is uh, the impact of the SNAM relationship, uh, and that's 100 megawatts worth of business. Uh, we've put that at 70 million pounds. SNAM has shared with us what those initial projects are, and we've uh, done a, an exercise to not only check that our standard products are going to fit them, uh, but given price indications on that. Uh, so that's, that SNAM uh, deal pipeline will come through our factory in the next three to five years. Included in the yellow bar is £12.5 million worth of Linda Gas projects. So you can see the two partnerships working really well to fill our factory. In terms of where the projects are that we are selling in our backlog, uh, you've got uh, all of the SNAM projects in Italy uh, across the three applications that ITM sell into. Uh, now, SNAM are an international company, and the uh, partnership agreement uh, includes a provision for international industrial scale project development, uh, but the first 100 megawatts are all in Italy. In terms of mobility, uh, you've got uh, projects in the UK and France, and these are sales uh, rather than anything to do with ITM motive. Uh, in chemistry, you have the residual amount due to be recognised on the refined project, uh, and the orange slice is grant UK grant funding to support the te technology roadmap that ITM Power have. If you go a step further back from the backlog, we have the tender opportunity pipeline, which is what we've quoted in the last 12 months. Uh, and you can see uh, the, the greatest uh, opportunity pipeline was 12 months ago prior to our partnership with Linda. Now, this was a point where ITM were offering full turnkey solutions with EPC elements. So that had an execution risk that was higher than we now uh, have. And the orange bars that have developed is the point at which uh, our joint venture and L Linda have taken the scope for the EPC and on-site works out of ITM scope. So of the 325 million tender opportunity pipeline, you've got 200 million for ITM of standard products and modules, and you have 125 million due to the joint venture for EPC work. All in all, representing far lower execution risk uh, and far higher bid discipline in terms of the quality of the quotes uh, that, uh, that we are making. The other impact of Linda is that uh, they allow us to quote uh, globally and uh, ITM have representatives in the US, France, Germany and Australia. But you can see from this map that we're actually quoting in far more places than that. Uh, the highest concentration by value and by volume is still in Europe. Uh, and for us, uh, you know, that, that seems to be the European green hydrogen strategy starting to uh, impact uh, our tender opportunity pipeline. I'm now going to hand back to Graham for a summary. Sure. Thanks, um, um, Andy, and thanks, Simon. Uh, so just a quick summary from me then. Uh, we're in a very rapidly growing market, which is uh, in the uh, gigawatts or tens of gigawatts. We have an extremely a good position um, in terms of technology, but also in terms of manufacturing, being the first electrolyzer company to move into a gigawatt factory and now having provided the financing for a second gig gigawatt factory. We have great partnerships with uh, Shell and Linda uh, and SNAM and Orsted and um, uh, Iberdrola. And a transformation as a result of working with those partners to our backlog and our pipeline. Um, and the fundraising, as Simon articulated, is um, to accelerate ITM power, technology, manufacturing and operations at the very large scale, which is where all of the industrial demand um, is coming through. And, and this is all about ITM Power uh, taking a leading position, gaining market share in what is a rapidly growing new um, market. So just um, um, to note, it's got a uh, transaction timetable, uh, says 150 million equity fundraise. We were uh, very heavily oversubscribed. 
uh, we took a, a moderately small amount of extra funding um, and um, uh, we closed at 165 uh, million. Uh, the time scale is timetable's there. Um, so for your knowledge, the general meeting is on the 11th. Uh, the SNAM investment completion and the admission and settlement are on the 12th of November. So thank you very much. Um, and we're happy to take questions. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, but just while the company take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already, I would like to remind you the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Meet Company platform. Lastly, before I do hand back to the ITM Power team, I would like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company. Immediately after this presentation has ended, you will be redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback uh, directly to them. Um, I know I haven't given you yet perhaps a great amount of time, guys, to, to look at the questions submitted today, but I'd now like to hand over to Simon Hudson to pose the questions to the ITM team where it's appropriate to do so. Simon, um, may I ask you just to read out the question, say who it's from, please? Uh, that would be great, thank you. Sure. Let's um, let's start with the most popular question today, which is what locations are you targeting for the next Gigafactory? Yeah, so, so look, um, uh, the next factory, we, we'll pull the trigger on the second factory when the first factory is at around 60 percent capacity. Um, there's a certain amount of planning we can do uh, beforehand and, and we'll be working closely with our partners. And you know who the three partners are to decide what the best strategic location is for that factory. So uh, the simple answer is uh, we haven't made that decision yet. Um, it will it will involve a number of different factors. And perhaps I can hand over to Simon and maybe Simon would like to comment on what factors he sees as the most important um, in, in citing the factory. Yeah, well, I think it's... Um... <clears throat> It's very important to make sure that we have uh, a location with the right uh, quality of workforce and um, also um, access to uh, to supply chain. And we've always tried to um, grow our supply chain in step with our production capacity. And um, we try where we can to um, to source locally, um, which is um, uh, makes the whole process a whole lot easier. I think there are um, several uh, drivers for different locations and it's um, it's nice to be uh, in demand uh, but Graeme's right we need to um, consult with our partners um, consider all of the variables <clears throat> to make sure that the uh, optimal location is chosen. I mean I, I would add that there's an intense amount of interest um, in manufacturing in many countries and and um, uh, the um, uh, the hydrogen strategies that have been articulated as part of energy strategies to get to net zero are also industrial strategies, uh, you know, including the UK. It's, it, and, and industrial strategies are all about uh, where you do manufacturing. Um, and uh, so we'll be looking very carefully, at, particularly at what government incentives there are uh, to establish new factories. Thanks. OK, now we come to a technical question from Anne at Edison, um, <clears throat> who points out that the round trip efficiency for electrolysis and fuel cells is significantly less than that for battery energy storage. Do you think that's going to hold back deployment of using hydrogen as a medium for storing surplus energy from renewables? Yeah, so uh, uh, very few of our projects are to do with repowering. So um, the principle of power to gas energy storage is you, that you put the hydrogen directly into the gas grid um, and then uh, the um, decarbonized gas decarbonizes every application that the gas grid touches. Uh, some of it is power generation, but actually most of it's heat. And the only way of decarbonizing the gas grid in total is by using green hydrogen. The other place where you go from hydrogen and putting it into a fuel cell is in transport. And the, 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 the problem with using batteries in heavy transport is that the more range you want, then the more batteries you need. And batteries are heavy. So if you've got a truck, for instance, and you want to have a long range, you need lots of batteries. And it becomes a, 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 a defeating principle of having more and more weight on the vehicle. So um, it, it's, it, efficiency is one parameter. 
Okay, um, and look, the, the, what's the most efficient energy storage device that is known? It's a supercapacitor. And supercapacitors have 95, 96% efficiency. Uh, but if you put them in a car, you'd get down to the end of your drive before they run out of energy because the supercapacity gives you a burst of energy. Now, a hydrogen vehicle is a combination of the three energy storage devices. You have a supercapacitor, you have a battery, and you have a fuel cell in a hydrogen tank. Okay, the, the supercapacitor does the burst of energy for acceleration uh, and, and works in tandem with the battery, and the fuel cell does the very, very long range stuff. So you use the right energy storage devices for the right applications. And if you want to think about energy storage for large scale renewable power, you know, if you want to store energy for an hour, you buy a battery. If you want to store energy for days, months or years, green hydrogen is the only way of doing it. And it's certainly um, uh, orders of magnitude lower cost at long duration. Hope, uh, and that's um, answered your question. And she's got a follow up one. Um, you project um, a halving in cost of electrolysis equipment. Um, but what does that mean for the cost of green hydrogen? Yeah, okay. I, I, I'll talk about the overall cost of green hydrogen and then perhaps hand it over to Simon for the electrolysis part. So, um, and the dominant cost of the cost of green hydrogen is the cost of renewable power. Um, I, I would direct you towards the McKinsey model for determining the cost of green hydrogen, uh, uh, which was published in the Hydrogen Council report. But if you assume... Uh, uh, um, four pence per kilowatt hour which you get for offshore wind in the uk and a 50 percent load factor and you're looking at electrolysis uh, of around uh, um just under 800 euros uh, um per kilowatt or 0.8 euros a megawatt which is um what we supply today then you look at hydrogen which is around three to three and a half dollars a kilogram um, and that's comparable with blue hydrogen um, if you then look at uh, going down in cost, we, we, renewable power met the record uh, a month ago in Portugal with solar at one and a half cents per kilowatt hour. It's an EDF project. Okay, at that cost of renewable power, you can make hydrogen for lower cost than methane in Portugal. Um, so that's net zero and lower cost than methane. Um, a part, uh, the third the three parts to the cost of, re of um, renewable hydrogen, green hydrogen. One is the cost of renewables. That's the dominant one. The other is the cost of e electrolysis. And the third is the load factor of the electrolyzer. And the, the McKinsey model outlines it very, very well. It's a really great model to look at. But Simon, do, do, can I hand over to you about the uh, cost reduction of electrolysis? Sure. I think you, you, you've covered it well. Um, if you look at the uh, all of the factors that contribute to the cost of hydrogen production, it is dominated by the use of power. So the fact that the price of renewable power is reducing so much is um, is is a, a, a huge factor in here. Um, the um, the efficiency of the electrolyzer is also very important, and we have a very um, rich uh, development pipeline and. Um, efficiency and cost are two of the primary areas that we're targeting in our ongoing development. I, I think one other thing to add just very simply is that the cost of the electrolyzer does dominate the return on capital employed for the person buying the electrolyzer and using it. So it, it, it is still fundamentally important in terms of our uh, market penetration and our market share. Okay, next question um, concerns how long it takes for the pipeline and backlog to translate into revenues. So of, of the pipeline and backlog that you've announced this morning, when do you see these coming through as um, revenues at scale? That's from Peter D. Okay, that's one for Andy, I think. Yeah, uh, so uh, if you go back two years, um, historically we were getting through between 40 to 60% of our backlog in, in any given period. Now that doesn't hold true for 2020. Um, part of that is uh, issues around COVID and the grant income going down. Part of that is around financial reporting standards uh, where we recognize income 
as kit is deployed rather than on a stage of completion. So uh, 2020 looks like a bit of an anomaly in terms of backlog to revenue. Uh, but going forward, uh, you've got uh, under contract will happen in the next year, in negotiation probably next one to two years, and the SNAM green bar at the top is, is probably over three to five years. With a waiting at the front, it has to be said. Okay, next question comes from uh, James. It's, do you see long-term strategic value in retaining ITM Motive, or do you think it's likely to be a spin-off sometime in the future? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's difficult to see what, what, what the future will hold in terms of either uh, uh, joint venturing or what we do ultimately with ITM Motive. But what we see with Motive, first of all, we have a very strong reputation um, in the UK for refueling, as Simon pointed out. Uh, but we see very good returns. Um, and, um, you know, uh, um, it, it has, there are a number of strategies within ITM Motive. One of them is demand for electrolysis equipment. Uh, one of them is strong returns in the area um, of fuel. Um, and, and one of them is all about um, us building experience, uh, um, further experience uh, with um, after-sales support and operations. So it is, a, it is a key element of ITM going forward, particularly as um, there is a, a significant move now from all OEMs to build trucks and buses and the OEMs in the area of trains to build trains. And um, the returns uh, um, from all of the modeling we've done and the experience we've had look very good. So, um, you know, I, um, for, for, from ITM Power's point of view, building that business and then looking at um, what the options are is something we'll be doing, uh, you know, very carefully at board level. Okay. Next question comes from uh, Adam Forsyth. Um, Andy spoke about bidding discipline a couple of times. Apart from cost, uh, what features of bids are important with customers? Are customers usually sufficiently aware of their needs? Or, or do you have to tell them what equipment they should have? Yeah, um, let me just, uh, uh, I'll, I'll tackle that first of all and then hand over to Andy. We, uh, with, uh, we said earlier um, that uh, bidding turnkey contracts involves bidding the EPC. And bidding EPC contracts is a very sophisticated thing. Um, and actually getting the cost structure right, but also getting the contractual terms and conditions right is very, very uh, important. Um, and um, at Linda are very experienced at doing that. They know all of the parameters in the market uh, for doing it. Um, they've got um, their head around all of the standard clauses that the uh, um, industry would expect to see. Um, and um, they're a very polished machine when it comes to estimating um, and estimating not only balance of plant, but engineering um, and procurement. And they, of course, have much more purchasing power than us. So the term discipline refers to their efficient ability uh, to quote for EPC. I, I think you've pretty much summed it up there, Graham. Um, uh, the, the other discipline uh, we have is, is probably a better qualification of uh, inquiries that come into us. Um, so if you compare what is in the, the opportunity pipe to previously, uh, it, there's gone through a process of go probability, how likely the project is to go forward, get probability, how likely ITM or ILE are to win that. So uh, there's all the engineering quality and discipline brought for the full turnkey solution, but there's also um, a qualification process that's really got a lot tighter uh, in the last 12 months. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I unpacking that a little bit, Linda are on site in refineries chemical plants all over the world. And they know those projects that where the customer is deadly serious versus those projects where perhaps they're gathering data. So actually we get a lot of intelligence from Linda as well. Okay, um, next question is from Kurt. Um, who asks, probably a question for you, Simon, um, who asked, will you ever offer alkaline electrolyzers or are you going to stick with PEM? And why are PEM better in your view? Okay, that's a, a, a quick one. Um, no, we won't offer alkaline electrolyzers. Um, we will stick with PEM. 
we've been developing the technology for a long time and um, for me it offers um, significant um, room for improvement and I, I believe it's the um, it's the, the the winning technology because it gives you um, the advantages <coughs> excuse me of um, of rapid response access to small footprint and it avoids some of the uh, chemicals that can often be uh, difficult to uh, handle particularly during uh, maintenance activities and um, so um, you know alkaline technology has been around for a long time you know, 100 years or so very well established um, but PEM arrived on the scene to try and address the shortcomings of alkaline and um, offer a solution which matches the uh, the challenges of today. Mm -hmm. Um, next question. I'm conscious that we've got quite a lot of questions here, so please forgive us if we don't manage to um, answer all of the questions that people are logging. Next question comes from Javier at Medio Banca, um, and he asks, could you give us any more details on the commercial partnership agreement with SNAM and on any potential collaboration on a global pipeline? Yeah, so, so we, we've had a very good and productive discussion with SNAM now over a year. Uh, and, and a very intensive one over the last six months. Uh, SNAM have a, a, a very significant portfolio of green hydrogen projects. Um, we have announced uh, the extent to which we have agreed with SNAM that we can announce. And so I wouldn't go any further than that, other than saying that SNAM will be making their own announcements about what their green hydrogen strategy is independent of ITM power. So um, I think that's uh, um, important to stress. But um, uh, I think that um, they're a key player in um, the European um, gas transmission industry, as I'm sure you all know. Um, they are very influential and they're a thought leader in the area of gas transmission in Europe. So they're a great partner for us. Um, Europe uh, um, has declared a target of 40 gigawatts um, over the next decade for uh, for electrolysis um, and um, all of the company all of the countries across Europe are announcing green hydrogen strategies with electrolyzer targets in the gigawatt level and and you can expect that um, uh, other governments that haven't declared yet will be at that sort of level okay next question comes from um, Annabelle at Stufel. Um, she asks, is, it, is this the end of your partnerships? Um, and points out that the Linda partnership took around a year to formalize, and it looks like about the same for this one. Can you move more quickly going forward? And are there any potential discussions for new partnerships? Yeah, can we move any more quickly going forwards? Um, uh, you, you know, um, I, I, I get the point, but um, large organizations, when they form a, 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 a partnership there is a a for them a proper corporate partnership uh, need to do it in, in, in a way that they feel happy to move forward uh, into the long term so um, uh, uh, can we move forward faster okay so other partnerships that that we're, we're working on of course um, and you've seen some of them uh, declared already are to do with working with renewable power companies um, to make lowest cost green hydrogen, you need to access lowest cost renewables. And, and one of the keys to the green hydrogen industry is low cost renewables with a renewable energy company with a desire to di diversify from just supplying electrons to supplying both renewable electrons and renewable molecules to industry. So we, we've got potential partnerships at the level of uh, renewable power and potential partnerships at the level of um, applications. Um, so, uh, but look, we're at the beginning of this journey, but every time uh, companies in this space make an announcement, everybody thinks that that's it, and it's not. This is a massively and rapidly growing market, and we're right at the beginning of the journey. Okay, I think this will have to be the last question. Um, apologies, we will answer any other questions logged um, online after the event. This is a question from Austin, um, and he's, he, he wants to know about the EU rule on refineries, red tea. Um, if they need to produce 14% of their output uh, renewably, what amount of hydrogen could that imply? 
in tons and how many gigawatts of electrolyzers would that need? Oh, good, good one, Austin. Always a difficult question, eh? Um, so look, 40, uh, over 400 terawatt hours of green hydrogen used in Europe. Uh, around half of that is through refineries. It's 200 terawatt hours. That's about 70 or 80 gigawatts of electrolysis at a 50 percent load factor. So if you take Europe and you multiply by about five, that gives you 80 times five, which is about 400 gigawatts of electrolysis. Okay, okay um, um, I think we're going to have to draw to a close there. It's now 11.30. Um, we'll answer all of the questions that you've logged and you'll be able to see them later. So I'll hand back now to um, Investor Meat Company. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. And, and just to reiterate that, the company will review all the questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate to do so. Um, Dr. Cooley, perhaps I could just ask for a last couple of words just to wrap up before I direct investors for feedback. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, so look, I, I, I'd summarise by saying uh, that we, we had a very successful funding round. Uh, we had some very engaging questions. Uh, and thank you, Austin, for all of yours uh, during the funding round. Um, we were delighted with the response of the capital markets to a green hydrogen proposition. Um, and uh, I think the markets um, actually did an incredible amount of research. And, and what we were most struck by in the funding round is how informed everybody was. I mean, there, there's a lot of research going on in the industry. There's a, a lot of capital out there uh, from ESG investors uh, looking for great uh, um, net zero technology propositions. And so, look, to all of the analysts who've been working on hydrogen and particularly green hydrogen, uh, thank you for your work. I, I think that um, the market uh, capital markets are now very well informed about the proposition. So uh, thank you all uh, for your interest in ITM Power. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to the ITM Power team for updating investors and analysts today. Uh, can I ask investors and analysts not to close today's sessions. You'll be ultimately redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback. If you've accessed the meeting via our website, the feedback page will appear in front of you a few seconds after the end of the webinar. If you've accessed via the link sent in the email, you'll be asked to log in to uh, access and submit your feedback. On behalf of ITM Power PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. Thank you all and good morning. Thank you.